What if the hormone that keeps you going is actually holding you back? Cortisol helps in short bursts, but if it stays high for too long, it starts working against you. So what can we do about it? Here is the good news. We now have two treatments for high cortisol. Before we go any further and review the details about the medications and the research behind them, I want to explain why we need to be very careful with both cortisol tests and treatments for high cortisol. And to explain it, let me remind you of Inspector Gadget. Remember him? His lovable, distinct style is entertaining and memorable, and it's also a very useful way to explain the double danger with cortisol. Inspector Gadget is known to alternate between two opposite behaviors. On the one hand, he's oblivious to real danger, and on the other hand, he overreacts to harmless things. That's exactly the trap we face with cortisol. Sometimes the danger is real and we miss it. Other times, we overreact to something harmless. Either mistake can cause real problems if we're not careful. So the first medication is called Corlim. The good news is for people with very hard to control type 2 diabetes. A large clinical trial called the Catalyst trial found that in some patients, the problem was too much cortisol, also called hypercortisolism. In the trial, people who tested high cortisol were treated with a medication called Corlim, which blocks the effect of cortisol. These patients saw real improvements in blood sugar and even lost weight. This new information is extremely important because it has the potential to affect millions of people. About 35 million people in the United States have diabetes type 2, and about half of the people with diabetes are considered to be not well controlled. In the Catalyst trial, people with a hemoglobin A1c over 7.5%, which means they have uncontrolled diabetes despite taking three medications, were tested for high cortisol, and 24% were found to have high cortisol. There were other ways in which they were determined to be uncontrolled, but I wanna keep it as simple as possible. So why is this information about high cortisol extremely important? The authors of the study, as well as many highly respected endocrinologists, are expecting a paradigm shift in how we treat difficult to control diabetes. As more doctors become aware that high cortisol may be the driving force behind uncontrolled diabetes, many more people will be tested for high cortisol. This is great if we interpret the results wisely. Now let's go back to the analogy, Inspector Gadget and his prototypical behavior, and look at when he was completely oblivious to danger. Here, he walks into the circus and joins the lion act, as if it were a friendly routine. He smiles at the crowd and performs with the lion, the whole time not realizing that the danger is aimed right at him. This is the first hazard of Inspector Gadget behavior, not recognizing a real threat when it's right in front of you. On the other hand, he overreacts to things that are harmless. In the second clip, Inspector Gadget spots a vending machine and decides it's an enemy in disguise. He starts probing the coin slot with his finger gadget, then bangs on the machine with his hammer gadget, breaks the machine, and makes a complete mess of an ordinary object. This is a second hazard of Inspector Gadget behavior, overreacting to something that is harmless. Now let's look at the Catalyst study in more detail. This is a bit complicated, so please bear with me. It is really important to understand, especially if your doctor orders cortisol tests for you. Catalyst enrolled a little over a thousand adults whose diabetes stayed uncontrolled despite multiple medications. Everyone was screened for high cortisol and 24%, that is almost one in four, screened positive. In other words, a quarter of the people had high cortisol levels. If someone screened positive for high cortisol, and I will explain the test later, then the study team first determined whether the extra cortisol appeared to be coming from the adrenal glands or from somewhere else. If it looked like the extra cortisol was coming from the adrenals, then the next step was an adrenal scan to look for an adrenal nodule. So if testing suggested an adrenal source of high cortisol and surgery was not planned, the person was moved to the medication phase. Those people were randomly assigned to either the medication Corlin or to a placebo for 24 weeks. The results were great. 
On average, Corlin improved diabetes control and helped with weight loss. Hemoglobin A1c decreased by about 1.3%, and people lost on average 11 pounds, while the placebo group did not improve. So that looks like really great results. We finally have an explanation for people with uncontrolled diabetes and an effective treatment that targets the high cortisol. But let's look back to the inspector gadget analogy for a closer look. Again, I'm using this analogy because it is important to recognize both both parts of the high cortisol problem and follow a careful stepwise evaluation so we treat the right problem and avoid unnecessary interventions. Let's start with the first aspect, missing the danger of high cortisol even though it's right in front of us. If you listen to the interview of one of the investigators, they say they expected that only 3% of participants would fail the cortisol test, but instead 24% failed. A quarter of the people showed signs of high cortisol. Some of these patients may have been working hard to lose weight and control their diabetes, but doctors thought they were non-compliant because their diabetes was not controlled even though they were prescribed many medications. But the whole time they were dealing with a hidden cortisol problem. Why was that unexpected? because doctors have always been told that true cortisol excess is uncommon, and when it does happen, patients usually look like classic Cushing's. So for years, many doctors, myself included, didn't screen unless people looked like classic Cushing's. Buffalo hump, purple stretch marks, moon faces. But in the Catalyst trial, we weren't talking about full-blown Cushing's. We were talking about high cortisol in the blood showing up in people with hard to control diabetes. So the first danger in inspector gadget behavior is being oblivious to real danger. Hypercortisolism is lurking out there. In everyday diabetes care, we don't routinely screen for cortisol because most patients don't show classic Cushing features. So the problem stays largely undiagnosed. Now to understand the second danger, we need to understand the cortisol test that was done. It is called a one milligram dexamethasone suppression test. You take the dexamethasone pill at 11 p.m. and go the next morning between 8 and 9 a.m. for blood tests to measure cortisol level and dexamethasone level. Cortisol level of 1.8 or higher was considered positive. In the trial, they tried to avoid false positives. A false positive means that the test looks abnormal, but the person's body is not actually making too much cortisol on its own. For example, women on birth control pills or hormone replacement therapy can have a higher total cortisol because estrogen raises the protein that carries cortisol in the blood. People with heavy drinking, severe depression or anxiety, or obstructive sleep apnea can also fail the test without having true Cushing syndrome. And if you're using steroids in any form, like pills, nasal sprays, inhalers, or injections, the test can detect that medicine as cortisol. It is picking up the drug, not your own overproduction. So for the trial, they excluded all these people to make sure that a positive test was indeed positive. Now, here is where the overreacting side of inspector gadget behavior shows up in real life. Number one, a clinical trial is a tightly supervised environment. Real world clinics are not. If a doctor does not order cortisol testing often, it is easy to get a false positive. They might not notice a patient is on estrogen. They might not ask about recent steroids. They may not realize that someone is on a steroid nasal spray for allergies or getting steroid injections for knee pains. They may forget that you work the night shift or that you have sleep apnea. Those details don't always make it into the medical records, but they can flip the results to positive. Another common trap, number two, is timing the follow-up labs. After a positive screen, you still need to check ACTH and DHEAS to figure out where the cortisol is coming from. Some doctors may try to save time and order those tests at the same time of the dexamethasone suppression test. This is the wrong thing to do. 
If you draw those slabs while dexamethasone is still active in your body, both can look falsely low. That would point to an adrenal gland, but it may not be the real source. So someone may have an abnormal cortisol test, but they're actually fine, and may have a random, harmless adrenal nodule on the CT scan, and you can end up sending someone to adrenal surgery for no good reason. The fix is simple. Get those slabs on a different morning without dexamethasone in the system. Number three. Also remember, the research was done in centers that focused on diabetes. People counted as uncontrolled on three medications were actually on three effective medications. But diabetes drugs are not equal. For example, a strong medication like tirzapatide can work much better than other much less effective medications. So if someone is not controlled on a high dose of tirzapatide, it is unusual and concerning. In real life, most people are not managed by diabetes specialists. Many may be uncontrolled on three medications simply because they are not on the right mix. That lowers the chance that a random positive cortisol test is actually the real deal. In statistics language, the pre-test probability is lower, which means a positive test is more likely to be a false alarm. Now add in the fact that doctors may miss interfering medicines like estrogen, and patients may forget to mention a steroid shot or nasal spray they took last week. Now the test is positive for the wrong reasons. What happens next? Many people get a CT scan of the abdomen. About 3 to 10% of adults have an adrenal nodule just by chance. We call that an adrenal incidentaloma. Most are harmless. If we panic, someone can end up losing an adrenal gland for no reason. This is the second inspector gadget behavior. In the first one, we miss real danger. In the second one, we overreact to benign finding. This behavior, by the way, affects both doctors and patients. Another interesting fact is in the Catalyst trial, 65% of people with high cortisol had normal looking adrenal glands. So the source of the high cortisol was unknown. It basically appears that the body was making too much cortisol and it is causing high sugar and weight gain. Remember, cortisol is a stress hormone. It helps the body handle illness and threats. In the trial, they blocked the cortisol receptor to see if the medication Corlim helps control the sugar. In real life, if cortisol is high, and the adrenal looks normal, we should ask why is the cortisol high before we jump to treatment? Maybe treating the root cause of high cortisol can solve the problem without needing lifelong treatment. So what can cause high cortisol? There are many possibilities to consider. For example, maybe the person has undiagnosed sleep apnea causing high cortisol. Here is another potential reason. This article says that mold toxicity increases the cortisol in the body. Mold is a lot more common than people realize. It shows up in homes, schools, offices, and even cars. If a car has water damage, mold can grow in the carpet or air vents, and every time you drive, you could be breathing in those spores. Small exposures are part of everyday life, and most healthy people can handle them without any trouble. But certain molds produce toxins that can become a real environmental hazard. That is why OSHA recommends serious protective gear, respirators, gloves, and full body coverage when professionals do mold cleanup. Pesticides in our food and environment, as well as air pollution, can also cause elevation of cortisol levels. Let's see another cause of high cortisol, heavy metal exposure. This study shows that exposure to heavy metal cadmium is associated with high cortisol level. Think of it like having a fever. Fever makes you feel awful with chills, body aches, sweats, headaches, and fatigue. Tylenol can bring the fever down, but you would not keep taking Tylenol forever without asking why you have fever. The body makes fever to help fight infections as part of the immune system. Cortisol is part of the endocrine system, of course, but it works the same way. It rises to help you handle stress illness, pain, inflammation, or certain environmental exposures. If cortisol stays high, we should look for the driver and fix what we can. Finally, we should be aware of the side effects and risk of Corlim. Corlim blocks the effect of cortisol at the receptor, so your pituitary gland in the brain senses too little cortisol action and pushes out more ACTH, which drives cortisol higher in the blood. While you're on Corlim, the receptor is blocked, so you do not feel the effect of the high cortisol. Now, imagine you stop after taking for a little while. Why do some people stop? Maybe they had a side effect, 
or maybe they could not get refills for some reason, or perhaps they were traveling and forgot to bring it. Once you stop, the block wears off over days and can take up to about six weeks to fully clear. During that time, ACTH and cortisol can stay high and act unopposed. So you can see a jump in blood sugar, quick weight gain with swelling, higher blood pressure, low potassium, and mood or sleep problems. So if you start Corlim, make sure you understand the long-term plan and exactly what to do if you ever need to stop. In addition to Corlim, there is another medication we can now use for high cortisol. The medication is called Isturisa, and it lowers cortisol by blocking its production inside the adrenal gland. In April 2025, the FDA expanded its approval so it can now be used when the body is making too much cortisol for any internal reason if surgery is not an option. With Isturisa, we follow the cortisol levels and adjust the dose so cortisol comes back to a safe normal range without dropping too low. Remember, with Corlim, we expect cortisol and ACTH to run high because the drug blocks the receptor, so it is not useful to monitor the cortisol level. So, I hope you can appreciate how complicated cortisol testing and interpretation really are. Many prominent endocrinologists are predicting a paradigm shift on the horizon. Doctors are going to look for high cortisol in people with uncontrolled diabetes. It is really important to understand the new opportunity to block cortisol and control diabetes as well as the new potential hazards. As awareness grows, many more doctors will start ordering the dexamethasone suppression test, but not everyone is comfortable with analyzing the results. Clinical trials are tightly controlled, real life is not. Most clinics are not diabetes or cortisol experts. If you think you might have hypercortisolism, bring it up to your doctor. And if you failed the dexamethasone suppression test, review possible false positive causes and get additional tests. When it comes to cortisol tests and treatments, I hope that you found it helpful to remember to avoid inspector gadgets behavior. We have two traps. We can be oblivious and miss a dangerously high cortisol, or we can overreact to a false positive or mildly abnormal results, sending people toward unnecessary surgery or medications with serious side effects. So don't ignore the line in the ring and don't pick a fight with a vending machine. Don't miss a real danger. If your diabetes is difficult to control, then do not be misled like Inspector Gadget by a sneaky lion. Listen to the warning growl of high cortisol and ask to be tested before you feel the bite. On the other hand, if you fail a dexamethasone suppression test, don't go full gadget on a vending machine. Not every adrenal nodule is trouble. Many are non-functioning and taking one out can mean unnecessary surgery while your real problem persists. So you should advocate for yourself. Make sure to ask the right questions and work with your medical team to reach the right diagnosis and the right treatment. Please make sure to leave a like and subscribe. This is not medical advice. See you in the next one.